Hi there, Craig Wilkinson, and welcome back to another, I think, very exciting episode of Dangerous But Good, hosted here on Podcast Party. We're going to be addressing a very, very strangely controversial subject, masculinity, shouldn't be controversial. I'm going to be listening to and responding to a fascinating panel discussion hosted by Krishna Andavalu, and he did this for Vice News. He gathered together a group of quite diverse men uh, and just began to discuss with them what it means to be masculine. Fascinating conversation. I'm going to respond as we go through. Let's watch and, and listen. Thank you all for being here and talking through masculinity, what it means to be a man. I have an eight-year-old son, and I'm seeing him absorb what manliness might mean. I, like, I'm thinking to myself, like, what does it mean to be a man? So he kicks off the panel discussion uh, by just showing that he's a father and he's got a son, and he's kind of grappling with issues, what is a man? What is a man? What is masculinity? And that's a question posed to this group. Uh, it's, it's, it shouldn't be a difficult question. A lot of people answer that question by saying, a man is anyone who identifies as a man. And there's a fundamental flaw in that argument, because in defining a word, you cannot use that word in the definition. If you say anyone who defines themselves or identifies themselves as a man is a man, well, what is he identifying as? You know, I identify as a man, but, but what is that? No, it's, uh, it's anyone, anyone who identifies as a man. It's, it's a flawed, circular argument. And so we've got to delve deeper into what is a man. Uh, and that's what this is all about. So let, let's listen some more. When I was young, being a man, you had to be tough. Now to me, being a man is knowing when to be soft. I don't identify as a man. I'm non-binary. Masculinity, something that can be possessed by man, woman, non-gender conforming person is just changing and very fluid. A man has to be efficient, competent, be willing to do what it takes for themselves and their loved ones. A masculine man is self-sacrificing. His responsibility. Someone that gets the job done, provides. I don't even know what that means anymore. I feel like tomorrow it's going to be something else. People are going to be like, you're wrong. It's this now. <laughs> to be a man is to be a adult human man. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, there's so much richness here to unpack, but uh, this particular gentleman saying that he's a bit confused about what it means to be a man, a bit confused about masculinity. He says, you know, I can't keep up. It's changing every day. I'm firmly of the belief that we do not need to reinvent masculinity. We need to rediscover it. The world has changed, and the way in which we pitch up as human beings, both male and female, has changed Far more women are in the workplace today, and that's beautiful. Far more women are, are doing traditionally masculine roles, and it's wonderful. You know, more women are graduating from university. We, we, uh, women have come such a long way in being empowered. Still a long way to go. Uh, men are uh, having to pitch up in ways that uh, we didn't in the past, and that's because the world has changed. It used to be very much an agrarian economy. It used to be very much an industrial economy, which required many blue-collar workers doing a lot of physical labor. And now it's become a lot more um, intellectual, knowledge-based economy, where, where men and women are competing very much on an equal footing. And so men have had to adapt the way they pitch up. But the essence of masculinity hasn't changed. Uh, what drives men hasn't changed. How we pitch up needs to have changed because the roles of men and women have changed. I don't think we can define a man and a woman anymore by the roles that they play. You can get women who are the breadwinner, and that's perfectly fine. You can't say that the man has to be the breadwinner. The man has a desire to provide, and that's fantastic, and we need to give him an opportunity to do so. But if he's not the primary breadwinner, it doesn't make him less of a man. If a woman is, it doesn't make her less than a woman. So I, I think we've overcomplicated this enormously. Uh, we've really overcomplicated it. One of the guys, for me, comes up with the only pure and correct and scientifically right definition of a man. He says, it's an adult male human being. Quite simply, that's what a man is. He has XY chromosomes, he has, uh, he has male genitalia, and uh, he's an adult male human being. That is what a man is. We often say, and we often hear people saying, well, your sex assigned at birth, which is what makes you a male or a female, is different to the gender. Now, I think we're just getting the word gender wrong. You know, we shouldn't be using the word gender. We should be using the word temperament or personality. Personality and temperament are very fluid and very diverse. And there's multiple, 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 multiple manifestations and different types of temperament and personality types. And these exist in both male and female. Gender, to me, is, is very simple. You're a male, you're, you're, that's your gender. You're a female, but you can have a wide variety of temperaments within a male and within a female. Where we've gone wrong is we've, we've attached stereotypes 
to men and stereotypes to women. Here's the thing. If a young girl comes to me, 12-year-old, 10-year-old, and says, you know what, I just don't identify with the other girls uh, in my class. Uh, I, I actually think I'm a man. I, I want to be a man. Uh, I say to her, why do you want to be a boy? Uh, why do you want to be a man? She says, well, I don't identify with the girls in my class or in my peer group. You know, um, I, I like playing with trucks. They like playing with dolls. I, I want to play sports and be competitive. I want to, actually, my dream is to be a fighter pilot in, 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 the, in the Air Force. You know, my words to, to that young girl is to say, I've got the best news in the world for you. I've got such good news for you. You don't have to be a man to do that. You can be a girl and grow up to, to a woman who is that, who's competitive, who's assertive, who, uh, who does traditionally manly things. You, know, you, you, you can become a fighter pilot. You can apply and go through the process. You don't have to go through surgery. You don't have to identify as a man to do the things that you think only men do. You don't have to take medication which completely messes with your, your beautiful God-given physiology and hormonal structure. You don't have to do that. You as a young girl can be whatever you want. You've got a temperament. You're still a girl. You're going to grow up into a woman, but you can still be all the things you want to be. You don't have to comply with what we say are gender stereotypes, but you're still a girl. You're still a woman. And that's such beautiful news because you can celebrate your womanhood as a fighter pilot, as a truck driver, whatever it is that you want to be. If a young boy comes to you and says, you know, I think I, think I actually want to be a girl. And uh, you say to him, well, why, why do you want to be a girl? He's 10 years old. You know, he's about to go through puberty. He says, well, I just don't identify with the boys in my class. They all want to play sport and they love watching sport and they run around playing these rough games. I, I just, I don't, I don't like that. I don't I feel, I feel left out. Uh, and, and I think I need to maybe take some puberty blockers and go through the process of transitioning. I would say to that young guy, I've got the best news in the world for you. Who you are is absolutely good. That's how God made you to be. You are a boy and you will become a man. You don't have to go through life-altering surgery. You don't have to go through hormonal treatment, which will mess with your, your hormones uh, and, and block the natural processes that your body's made to do. You don't have to do that to be the person you want to be. You don't have to play sport. You don't have to be wildly competitive. You don't have to be part of the, of the, uh, the team of men who, who, who behave in a certain way. You can be soft, caring, loving. You can, you can aspire to the career you want. And you've just told me you want to be a nurse one day because you love caring for people. You can do that. You're still a boy. You'll grow up to be a man. But you can be a boy and a man who does the things that you want to do without having to become a woman. You're a man. Be that man. Soft, gentle, caring, loving, doesn't like sport, doesn't like being competitive. That is absolutely fine. It's okay. So definition of a man, adult male human being. You don't have to identify as a man. You are a man and you can be whatever you want. You don't have to fit the stereotypes that society puts on you. That's what a man is. Let's listen to some more. The debate gets very interesting. The, the comments get very interesting. Uh, fascinated to, to, to delve deeper. Is there a crisis in masculinity? And if so, what is that crisis? The thing that I see is a lot of deconstructing generational trauma. Be a man. Boys don't cry. I think that's one of the reasons why we see it as a crisis, because we're actually trying to redefine what it means to be a man, and none of us have any idea. We're just out here trying to be whoever we are. Historically, being a man was rooted in patriarchy and misogyny, and now we realize how harmful that has been over the years, and so we don't really know how to define where we're supposed to be. Here, here are some very interesting points. Um, one of the men is saying that historically being a man was rooted in patriarchy, uh, misogyny, uh, and, and to some degree toxicity. And it's a very interesting comment that because it's a widely held belief that pretty much everything that's wrong with the world today is because of men, because of the patriarchy, because of misogyny. And I'd like to challenge that belief. Uh, Let's look at the history of the relationship between men and women. Uh, I'm looking at five elements of this history. The one element, two are good, well, three are good, and two are less than good. But none of them define the entire history uh, and, and, and how men and women have been. One element of, of our history is that men have uh, given their lives for their families. Men have been the one who've gone to war, uh, now, whether that was 
justified or not, that's another question entirely. But many of the ones have, been, have gone to war. They're the ones who've died in battle. Millions and millions and millions of men over the years have died in battle and died fighting for their families, fighting for the safety of their families. Men have traditionally been the ones who get up at night when there's a bump in the night or there's someone at the door who shouldn't be there who get up and, 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 and face the, the danger. Men have been the ones who've generally rushed into danger. If you take 9-11, the, the 9-11 incident, uh, 330 first responders died that day. Brave, brave men and women. 330 died. 300 of those were men. Uh, they, they rushed into that burning building to save. They gave their lives to save people. You look at the Titanic. When the Titanic sank, 19% of the women on board that ship drowned. 75% of the men. Why? Because the men routinely gave up their place uh, in lifeboats for women. They sacrificed their lives for women. Now, you cannot tell me that's toxic. You cannot tell me that's bad. That's a beautiful, beautiful gift where men said, uh, uh, let me die rather than you. So men have given up their lives uh, for, for women and children and for, for country and for principle. Uh, and that's a beautiful, noble thing. Second aspect of history, men have generally done the very hard jobs. Uh, the roads that you see uh, around us, the building, the infrastructure, the oil that's extracted from, from the ground at, at great risk, the construction, all of these things vast majority that's done by men. And, and that's why the vast majority of industrial accidents are uh, men are the victims of that. So men have done the hard jobs and continue to do the hard jobs. You know, the great and phenomenal infrastructure we enjoy today is largely built uh, by men with, with great physical toil and physical uh, impact uh, on men. Uh, so they've done this. They've, they've done the highest. I mean, those are beautiful, noble things that have contributed enormously to, to the peace we enjoy today and to the many of the comforts we enjoy today. Where men have gone wrong historically uh, is they have uh, treated women as less than. Uh, they've not allowed women to vote until, I mean, relatively recently in our human history. Uh, and of course that's that's wrong. That That's bad. That, that is an element of the patriarchy. That's, that's, that's negative. And we've got to acknowledge that. You know? Women should be in leadership positions. We, we, we should co-create and, and co-rule and lead this world as men and women. Uh, and that's been a real fault of, of our history. Fourthly, men have, uh, well, not all men, but many men have treated women as sex objects. We've seen a lot of physical and sexual abuse. The whole, the whole Me Too movement came out of a backlash to this, that, that women have found themselves exploited by men who viewed them purely and merely as a sex object. Absolutely wrong. So you've got two elements of history where men, noble, sacrificial, giving their lives, doing the hard work, and then you've got two elements of history where women treated as less than, held down from leadership positions that we need to fix and we are fixing, and men treating women as sex objects, we're fixing that as well. The fifth element, and, and this for me overrides so many things, is that largely throughout history, men and women have co-existed, co-created, done what they needed to do. Women have done phenomenal things, men have done phenomenal things, but generally, largely, they worked together to build families, to build societies, played different roles because of different circumstances, but worked together largely. Uh, the happy family, the nuclear family, I mean, that, that is more the norm than the, sadly now, uh, the broken family is become, becoming uh, very much the norm. But historically, men and women working together, having children, uh, doing whatever they need to do to raise these children, uh, co-laboring together, working together in harmony, Men and women have not been in this constant war of attrition where men hate women, women hate men, and they're fighting and dominate. No, that's a very, very, uh, very wrong narrative. Men have done their best to romance and win the hearts of, of, of women, and women have responded to that. And there's been love and care and nurture and joint responsibility and working together to build families, societies, nations. That's the, that's the overwhelming narrative we should enjoy. Now, obviously, we need to address the things that are negative, the things that are toxic, the things that are harmful. And, and really, they fall into those two categories. Men viewing women as, as uh, less than, uh, not, uh, and, and putting in place a glass ceiling where women are not able to realize their full potential and contribute as we need them to do. Uh, and secondly, treating women in, 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 a, in a sexual fashion, as a sexual object, the cat calling, the the, the physical, the the, the uh, sexual abuse. I mean, those are absolutely wrong, and we have to deal with those. But if we just view history in light of those two things, it's 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 not accurate uh, and it's not right. 
and it doesn't help us to build the society we want to build. Let, let's hear some more. Fascinating, fascinating conversation. I think the reason that they're saying it's a crisis is because the box has gotten so small for just being, say, straight, just being a hetero, right? Because if you do anything, women judge you. What do you mean anything? If I dance a certain way, or if I wear my hair a certain way, if I dress a certain way, they go, real men don't do that. And so you get scared to move a certain way because you don't want to get judged or outed out of the accepted part of your community. And we don't know where to be. Like, where's the safe place to be for men now? You know what I mean? This, this gent makes the point that um, society has pretty rigid stereotypes and rules about what is a real man. And I mean, the, 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 the term real man is triggering for a lot of people because what does that mean? A lot of boys grow up uh, in an environment where society is teaching them or telling them or giving them messages about what a real man is. And they just feel they don't comply. And that leads to a lot of self-hatred, a lot of low self-esteem and a lot of pitching up in a very bad way. So what, what, are, the, what are the main misconceptions uh, that we hear about what a man should be by society? And, and these messages are rooted in media they're all, all, often um, held by women as well, but uh, by boys and men. You know, boys will be boys. Uh, real men don't do that. So what are they? I mean, for me, there, there really are four. And, and perhaps the fifth one has emerged in the last few years. Four big lies. Sex, power, money, big boys don't cry. Simple as that. You know, that as a man, you have to be virile. You have to, to be attractive. Uh, you have to have multiple sexual partners. The more of that you do, the more of a man you are. What an incredible lie. You know, uh, true masculinity, real masculinity, is someone who can be loyal and committed and faithful to one partner. I mean, that's, that's true masculinity. Resist temptation. Um, sex doesn't define you as a man. Your sexual partners don't define you as a man. It, it, it's got nothing to do with who you are as a man. Self-control does that. Loyalty, uh, commitment. These are the things that define masculinity. So there, there's the big lie. Second big lie, power. You need power and money. <laughs> you know, the, the, the better the car you drive, the more of a man you are. The more money you earn, the, the better the, the school is that your kids go to, the, be, the better the neighborhood, your car, your clothes, your, the woman on your arm. I mean, these are just false notions about masculinity. The more powerful, dominant, assertive you are, the more um, you're able to subjugate, the bigger your biceps. Uh, you know, these, these are completely wrong concepts of masculinity, which a lot of boys grow up with. And, and a lot of media and advertising, and as I said, even women – perpetuate these uh, misconceptions about what masculinity and men feel the pressure to be this. Truth is, uh, money doesn't make a man. Truth is, yes, of course, we need to take responsibility and do the very best we can to provide for our loved ones and to, to take responsibility. But money doesn't define who you are. Your car doesn't define who you are as a man. Your clothes don't define you. What defines you is your character and, and how you pitch up. Uh, big boys don't cry. Another huge misconception. Men are taught to be resolute and taught to be fine always and always have it together and never be vulnerable. That's a lie. Vulnerability is not a weakness. Vulnerability is actually a strength. It's much easier for me to say, uh, I'm fine when I'm not fine. It's harder for me to say, actually, I'm really struggling. Uh, I need to be quite confident uh, in and of myself to, to do that. And so these four big lies, sex, power, money, big boys don't cry, are a narrative that a lot of boys grow up in. That's what we need to fix. That's what we need to heal. That's what we need to change in society. The fifth one I mentioned, which has emerged only, only of late, is that uh, men are trash. Uh, men are inherently wrong, uh, inherently bad. Uh, I mentioned on previous podcasts uh, a survey done by YouGov where they asked men, you know, is masculinity a good thing or a bad thing? And, and the age group... 18 to 24, 46% said it's a bad thing. We're growing up in a society where masculinity is deemed to be wrong, toxic, bad. And it's such a lie. Masculinity is a beautiful gift to humanity. We need it. We need to embrace it, encourage it, inspire it. But we do need to teach it what, how to behave, to contain certain things, to harness certain things, just like a vehicle. A car can drive at 180 kilometers an hour. It shouldn't do that. It needs to drive within the speed limit. A car needs to stop at a traffic light that's red. And that's masculinity. We've got the power to do these things. We need to harness it and use it only for good. And so we don't need to redefine it. We need to rediscover it. But we need to set the right boundaries and teach men what it means to be a man and how to pitch up as a man. Let's listen to some more of this fascinating conversation. You know, I was what you would call a toxic masculine male growing up. And uh, I had good men that sewed into me. You know, they gave me good advice, but I never found manhood and I never understood my place as a man until one day I humbled myself and I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you right now, 
Walking with God changed my life forever. Can, That's you, defi- what can you define toxic masculinity? Like, I would say toxic mean? masculinity is where you're using that leadership role or that aggressive nature in a harmful way to harm other people, to get your way. It's Important to jump in there, and he's asked, define toxic masculinity. Um, and it's very simple to define that. Masculinity in and of itself is not toxic at all. Men can be toxic, women can be toxic. And generally the way in which toxic uh, men behave in a toxic fashion is they dominate, they control, they take what's not theirs to, to take. They, they, instead of using their strength well to serve and to love, they use their strength to take and to dominate and to control. Any form of that, any form of domination is toxic. Any form of harming of another human being is toxic. It's wrong, it's, it's clear, but that's not inherent in masculinity. Let me tell you this, inherent in masculinity, the God-given DNA that we have as men, inherent in that is the desire to protect. It's the desire to be a safe space. It's the desire to make the world a better place. This is, this is healthy masculinity, uh, and that's pure masculinity. That's what masculinity is. If it's toxic, it's gone wrong. It's not that it is toxic. It's that the person who is a man is behaving in a toxic manner. Toxic femininity shows up in a different way. Toxic femininity generally tends to manipulate, control, verbally, with the tongue, lashing, uh, insulting, uh, social cancelling. This this tends to be the way in which women behave in a toxic fashion. Men, uh, when they're toxic, tend to dominate, control, use their fists, use sexual abuse. I mean, this is absolutely wrong, absolutely toxic. Humans can be toxic, and being toxic is wrong. <laughs> toxic means I'm harming someone else. I'm taking someone else, taking what's not mine. I'm crossing boundaries I should never cross. I'm violating. That's toxicity, uh, but that's not innate in either masculinity or femininity. It's not innate in humanness. Uh, it, it destroys humanness, and we need to stop that. We need to deal with that. We need to call it out in whatever form it takes. Let's continue. I don't find masculinity toxic in and of itself, but I do believe bad men exist. Some people make masculinity into a caricature, this alpha bro tough guy. Exactly. And I find the low key guy who was a really great father and a great husband and maybe not like drinking raw eggs every day <laughs> to be a lot more masculine than the alpha bro who's going and like banging 20 women per weekend and not a responsible man. I find it more masculine to be a good guy. Yeah, he has a great point, you know, this guy is saying that true masculinity, true men are not the macho guys, not the guys who go around, you know, sleeping with women indiscriminately, the guy who's uh, the life and soul of the party, the guy who's got the, the biggest biceps, that, that's not true masculinity, that's a distortion, that's a caricature. True masculinity is the guy who's a great father. Uh, a great and loyal partner and husband, the guy who makes the world a better place. He may not be noisy, he may not be big, he may not be powerful, he may not be rich, he may not have any of those traditional macho things, uh, but he's a good man and he's a strong man and he does what he needs to do. He takes responsibility, steps up. Uh, that's that's true masculinity. And so we got to move away from the caricatures, the, 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 the stereotypes, which are very negative uh, to true authentic masculinity. And, and I'll talk a lot about what makes a man a good man uh, as, as we progress. But uh, very good point. We've got to change how we see true masculinity from the macho, <laughs> big sex power money guy, you know, doesn't cry, to the real man, the, the real man who steps up and does what needs to be done. Good father, good citizen, good brother, good friend, just a good man. It's continued. Irrelevant whether or not we attribute like having a good ethical compass to being masculine. Attributing that to like the gender constructs which we have made up just feed into needless roles that uphold the patriarchy. First time I remember my dad telling me he loved me was when I was 17. I'm appreciative of all the other things, being present as a provider, but in terms of I want to talk to my dad about, you know, sex, or this person broke up with me and I'm feeling pretty sad about it. I didn't have those conversations. When you do grow up in a broken home and you don't have a father in the home, you recognize how important both males and females are in raising a child. This is such a good point here, uh, talking about fatherhood and uh, the crucial need of men and women in the lives of both boys and girls. Every boy and every girl needs male and female uh, to raise them and ideally biological father, biological mother, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, It can be. There's a beautiful African proverb we hear all the time, it takes a village to raise a child. And uh, men and women, older men and women, uncles, grandfathers, uh, male teachers, coaches, uh, mothers, grandmothers, sisters, aunts. I mean, these are necessary in raising healthy adults. 
And even if a child grows up in a, in a single parent home, uh, in that community, there are uh, older role models of, of their same gender to, to model and role model to them what it means to be a man or to be a woman. Um, many of these men grew up with, without a father in the home and they feel the pain uh, and they feel the, the disconnect. And they look to peers, they look to the guys on the corner, they look to gangsters, they look to all kinds of different older male role models, some good, some bad, some ugly, uh, to get their cues as to what it means to be a man. And so as a society, we need to make sure that we have beautiful, strong male and female role models uh, modeling to the next generation of boys and girls what it means to be a human first, but what it means to be a man and to be a boy. Uh, absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. We need fathers, we need mothers. Boys need fathers and mothers, girls need fathers and mothers. Society needs the masculine and the feminine. The beauty about our world is that uh, men and women are different. <laughs> the masculine and the feminine are different. We, we're more same than different. You know, men and women have more, way more in common than they have difference. You know, we all want love, we all want connection, we all want purpose, we all want safety, we all want, you know, uh, these are the things which are just rooted in our common humanity. And before anyone's a male or a female, they are human beings, and that's a far more important identity. But there are different drivers of men and women. And of course there's an overlap. I mean, it's a bell curve, and the bell curves intersect, as we know. Uh, but there are some fundamental differences in what drive men and drive women. Anyone who's raised a boy and a girl will know that there are some innate differences. Um, equal, equally valuable, worthy of equal opportunity, but there are some differences. The way young boys uh, behave in a, in a playground, different to the way young girls, and we need to be able to recognize that, celebrate that, embrace that, and model to them what it means to be, first of all, a good human being, but secondly, a man um, and a woman, and, and how they pitch up in the world. I'm going to talk about the six virtues which I believe uh, make a man a good man, and many of them apply to women as well. But remembering the definition, the starting point of what a man is, adult male human being, that's who you are. You might have a complete, you know, a full range of different temperaments from wildly competitive and, and you know, testosterone driven to very, very soft uh, and caring. As a man, I believe there are two uh, fundamental faces that we need to wear, traits we need to have, uh, roles. One of them is the warrior. The warrior is the man who says, you know what, I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to step up and do what I need to do. I'm going to uh, tend my fields. I'm going to, if need be, take it on the chin. Uh, there'll be times when I need to just push through, guts through, because that's what I need to do as a man, to take responsibility. That's the warrior. That's the warrior. But that's only half of man. The other half is the, the lover. The one is able to be vulnerable, caring, soft, gentle. The one is able to articulate his feelings. He's able to listen to someone else. He's able to have deep emotional conversations. Who, who feels uh, uh, confident and at ease when he's having a deep emotional conversation with his daughter, his son, or his wife. Who's able to shed tears. Who's able to feel and be a caring, nurturing, soft, safe, emotional place. Both of these are crucial. We need both. If we just have the one... Chances are you're going to be passive. Chances are you're not going to step up and take responsibility when you need to. If you just have the other, chances are you're going to be this macho, detached, emotionally unavailable man. And that's not true masculinity. We need both to be true masculine men. Let's continue with the conversation. To me, I didn't really have it there. But I think that I always wanted one. I wound up at a certain age going outside and trying to find what man masculinity was outside. Same. And so I went on the corner and there were 20 of us on the corner and none of us had dads. Same. We were all messed up. And so we all taught each other the wrong way to love, to be loved. I think in society, there's way more people like that. And a lot of kids who don't have fathers in the home, excuse me, oh, no, no, um, look for that father in the world or in a different way. In the yeah. Yeah. Continuing with the father theme, you know, the one gent was saying he didn't have a father uh, and he hung out on the corner of a street with 20 other guys who, who, and none of them had fathers. So what happened was they ended up teaching each other what manhood is and they taught each other the wrong things because they were tuning into the narrative, uh, the worldly, the, the media-driven narrative of what a man is, the macho, the toxic, the false. And so many young boys uh, don't have that. So where do they look? They look in the wrong places for their cues and their models of what it means to be a man. And that's why uh, male role models and mentors 
we are in uh, International Men's Month. International Men's Day is in is the 19th of November. And it's so crucial. And, and the theme this year is around mentorship. We need mentors. Uh, young boys need older male role models and mentors to teach them, model to them, uh, display to them, uh, discipline them as to what it means to be a man. Without that, uh, young boys go awry. Every young boy growing up wants to be a good man, but he doesn't know what it is. And he, and he only knows what it is when it's displayed to him by a man, by a man who's walked the distance and is a man, he's grown up to be a man, and he, and he shows the younger boy what it means to be a man. Mentors are absolutely crucial. Male role models are absolutely crucial. If we don't have them, we look to the wrong people. Young boys teach each other. And when you've got a bunch of young guys with testosterone flowing and not much wisdom trying to mentor each other, it's going to go awry. It's going to go horribly wrong. And that's when the narratives of uh, abusive, toxic, um, macho type masculinity come into play, it, where there's a lack of good, solid, older male role models. Let's continue. Attributing proper family values to a heterosexual couple with children is not effective. I don't think that it's necessary to attribute men and women to certain roles in the household. Male and female matter. God gives you one of those identities, you take on that role. There's a masculine crisis because men are not taking responsibility for the God-given roles that they have in society. The responsibility that I've learned is how to not enforce my power over women, over people. So you're saying that that role gives men more privilege, like an advantage and privilege. I'm saying that it is more self-sacrificing. I do not have free time. I'm thinking about my wife, my kids. It's my business. I think to summarize, a man is an adult male human being. Men and women are more similar to what they are different, but there are some fundamental differences. And what does it mean to be a good man? I, I believe that there, there, there's, I mean, there, you, could, you could discuss this in a thousand different ways, but there's six fundamental traits that men need to uh, embrace. Now, whether they are soft, uh, competitive, whatever, I mean, the temperament's a different thing. Uh, men and women, there's an overlap in the temperaments of men and women. And that's where I think we go wrong in terms of trying to say gender's fluid and they're multiple. I think temperament's fluid and they're multiple different temperaments. Uh, but how do you pitch up as a man? For me, uh, there are six virtues. The six pack, I call it, the six pack of masculine virtues. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, for a man to have a six pack on his stomach, it's great. You know, for him to enjoy drinking a six pack every now and again, you know, as long as he doesn't drink them all at once. I mean, that's also cool. But the most important six pack a man can have is the one inside, his character traits. Uh, and for me, I'm going to run through quickly those six. So if you're an adult male human being and you embrace and um, do your best to fulfill these six traits, to me, that's, that's true and authentic masculinity. Number one, use your strength for good. We've got strengths. We have influence. I mean, strength can be defined as your ability to impact the lives of other people, uh, your ability to impact the world, other people. Every one of us has it as a man. Uh, it's emotional. It's, it's verbal. It's physical. It's economic. It's psychological. There are many ways in which we have strength. Now, what truly defines a man is how, how do you use that strength? If you fail to use it, you're being passive. That's not masculinity. You're failing to step up and stand up and be where you need to be. Say what you need to say. Step up and stand up for what's good and against what's wrong. I mean, that's, uh, that's passivity and that's not masculinity. So you can fail to use your strength. You can misuse your strength. You can use it to take what's not yours, to dominate, to, to control. I mean, that's absolutely, that's toxic. That's not masculinity. True masculinity uses its strength, his strength for good. <laughs> Only for good. To love, serve, honor, protect, provide. Number one quality. Number one, the first of the six pack of masculine virtues, use your strength for good. Number two, define yourself by character. <laughs> you know, we often as men define ourselves by the externalities, you know, by, by, by the clothes I wear, the swag that I have, the car that I drive, the, the neighborhood I live in, the job I have, the money I earn. I mean, these are all external things. These can come and go. What can never come and go and what shouldn't come and go is, is your, your values inside. So true masculinity defines itself, himself, by its internal virtues, value system, integrity, uh, self-discipline, self-control. Define uh, and value yourself by your character, not your image or your possessions. Thirdly, true masculinity tends its fields. It steps up and takes full responsibility. Uh, it has roles and duties to play. It has people in his life. In his life, he has uh, himself to take care of. He has material possessions and goods. How good a steward is he? So every man has a field. And in that field are all the things that he's responsible for. 
true masculinity steps up and takes full responsibility for those. Fourthly, true masculinity builds a band of brothers. You know, we, we cannot do life alone. We're designed to walk in a, in a group of men that, that sharpens each other, holds each other accountable, encourages each other, honors each other, supports each other, uh, calls each other out when necessary. That band of brothers helps us to be the best man we can be. Most men are lonely. You know, They have men they can have a beer with, watch a game with, but do they have men that truly know them, that truly speak into their lives, that truly help them uh, to be, be the best that they can possibly be? So building this band of brothers is absolutely crucial. Number five, mentor the next generation. True masculinity leads the kind of life that models to the next generation what a good man is. True masculinity says, you know, I need mentors. I need to look to older men, even my peers, uh, sometimes men I don't even know, to teach and help me to understand what it means to be a good human being and a good man. And true masculinity says, I'm going to impart that to the next generation. I'm going to be a great father. I'm going to be a great mentor. I'm going to live a life that's worth copying. And finally, number six, uh, and this just sums it all up, true masculinity makes the world a better place. Makes the world a better place. My wife is a better woman because I'm in her life. My children are better human beings because I'm in their life. My, my colleagues are better. My friends are better. My society, my country, my company, uh, all of these things are better because I'm in their lives. And I make a commitment as a man to give more than I take, to never take what's not mine, never abuse, always love, support, honor. I make the world a better place. You can really see the type of man a man is by looking at the people in his lives. What impact does he have on them? Are they flourishing and thriving? Are they safe? Are they secure? That is the sign of a good man. What impact does he have on the people in his life? What impact does he have on the environment, the society in which he lives? That's the definition of true men. So if you're an adult human male and you embrace those six virtues, you're a man. You can be a florist, a nurse, a stay-at-home dad. You can be a fighter pilot, a CEO. It doesn't matter what you are. You can have a temperament that's highly competitive. You can have a temperament that is not competitive at all. If you adopt those traits, uh, you're a man. You're truly masculine. We don't have to submit to the stereotypes of what a man is or the roles, but take responsibility. Be a good man. Use your strength for good. Make the world a better place. That's what a true man is. See you next time. <laughs>